Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this webinar, A Place for Prevention. I'm Ashley Moore, Corporate Communications Manager at SIPFA, and I will be moderating today's presentations and discussion. This is one of a series of webinars that SIPFA is hosting, where we're examining a range of issues for public finance professionals, both those emanating from the pandemic, as well as matters preceding it. Issues from the professional and the technical, right through to the personal. Today, we're taking a look at the issue of place-based policymaking and its role in prevention. We at SIPFA view prevention as something that should be treated as a key investment in the public sector. Preventative action will be key to mitigating the heavy burden expected to fall on public services, particularly social care, in the coming years, and safeguard them in the event of another crisis, public health or otherwise. Before I hand over to our speakers joining us in our webinar today, I want to remind everybody that we do want this to be an interactive event and that this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to our panel for them to respond to and discuss. You're able to submit a question via the question panel on the GoToWebinar dashboard you should have on your screen. Once the presentations have concluded, I will put those forward to our speakers. You can submit a question at any time, so there's no need to wait until the end of the presentations. So to discuss this topic today, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, SIPFA's very own Dr. Eleanor Roy. Eleanor started her career in academia, completing a PhD and postdoctoral research in immunology and microbiology, and worked for the Welsh Parliament before joining SIPFA. She is now our health and social care policy manager, leading on SIPFA's work on investment in prevention, social care funding reform, and the integration of health and care. So without any further preamble, I'll hand over to Ellie. Thanks very much, Ashley. Um, first of all, thanks all for joining and thanks also to the other speakers for participating in this episode of our series. Last year, SIPFA published a report on work we've done with Public Health England, which aimed to improve the evaluation of investment in prevention through the development of a com common and transparent approach. The focus of this work was in public health and to say the least, I think the importance of this area has certainly been highlighted by recent events. However, the framework and the principles that underlie it are applicable across the entire public sector. So why did we think there was a need to improve the evaluation of prevention? Well, it would provide evidence to support better decision making on how resources are used by giving a consistent framework with which to look at the costs and benefits. It could bring the longer term impacts to light as these are often quite difficult to see. It would also increase the transparency and accountability for how resources are currently invested. And perhaps most importantly, it would provide a common language across local systems and places, including identifying where costs and benefits fall in different organisations, as is often the case with prevention. The framework is not particularly complex. It consists of existing tools which could be used across different types of intervention, different organisations and at local, regional or national levels to evaluate a preventative pro project or programme. It can be used both at organisational level and in planning across a place-based system such as an integrated care system. Adopting these methods could enable investment to be measured in a methodical and consistent manner but by a shared understanding of what good practice looks like. It would not only aid in making the case for individual programmes, but increase transparency and allow for the analysis of such interventions over both time and place to show the extent of preventative investment, or as may be the case, the levels of disinvestment. The overall ambition behind the work is to change the mindset around prevention. We think it should be viewed and treated as a true investment rather than perhaps a tap that's quite easy to turn off when budgets are tight, as has been the case in recent years. It is a true investment in that it yields benefits for the future. Whether these be improvements in population health and wellbeing, or reducing future demand across any number of services. SIPFA have also been supporters for a long time of a place-based approach, and this is particularly important for prevention as the, the impacts often span different organisations. Unfortunately, our public services are not funded on the basis of place, so this can be quite difficult to achieve. As we highlighted in our recent submission to Treasury in the spending review, there's a real need for a more holistic framework that supports efficient and effective place-based approaches. 
Place-based funding could allow for spending decisions to reflect local circumstances better, maximising integration and alignment of public services, whilst at the same time improving outcomes and value across the board. This alignment of place and prevention is where we share common ground with breaking barriers, as their playbook is demonstrating how place-based approaches can work in practice. And we're going to hear more about that in this session. So I'd like to hand back to the chair and move on to our other speakers. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ali, for those opening remarks. Our second speaker is Dr. John Bashford, Director of Research at Breaking Barriers Innovations. John is a registered nurse and has over 25 years of experience working in health, social care and education in the public and voluntary sectors. Thank you for the questions that you've been submitting so far. And without any further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Bashford. Hi, thanks very much. And thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to talk uh, very uh, quickly about uh, BBI and then go into talking about the programmes work we've been doing in Kent and Portsmouth. Um, and we'll, we're also joined today with Muted. Um, Antid Marsh uh, from Kent, who's the um, SRO for Workforce and Innovation with the Design and Learning Centre, and Gordon Fowler, who's the Director of Finance at Solent NHS Trust. And all three of us will be available for questions as well at the end. So Breaking Barriers Innovations has been going since 2016 and we're about helping local areas working with NHS, local authorities and other partners and stakeholders to, to make place-based approaches work. And it was towards the end of uh, November, it was actually November 2018, that we developed our playbook. And the playbook is really designed to create momentum and to get consensus across system leaders and involve people in, in really moving to a place-based approach that's practical and innovative. Because we, we tend to approach uh, system change and delivery and commissioning from all the perspectives of different stakeholders or individual organisations. And the challenge, and we, we, we use building blocks in the playbook to address this, is to really get people onto the same page about this, thinking really that what we need to do is align the strategy to the single thing that's going to make the biggest difference. So really getting all the different sectors leaders to agree to that. But this is not about a piece of paper. This is about an evidence base. It's not ideological. And it's really about being able to translate what we want to achieve into culture and practice, because sometimes people go into the room, think they've agreed something, go out again, and actually everyone's back into their silos again. So we have to get that strategic alignment right and agree what the dominant strategy is going to be to achieve the things we want to do. But also we have to make sure that we've got residents, service users, local people fully engaged with this, that they're included and empowered to take part and that that's sustainable over the longer term, so that we have proper community support for a co-design approach to any changes that are gonna take place. And then we have to bring the workforce with us, not just in terms of recruitment and retention, but thinking about breaking down some of those professional and organizational barriers through cross-professional learning networks, use of skills ladders and competency-based learning to really make place something that the workforce feels able to deliver and we're, set and with a, a workforce for the future all of that culminates with an action plan so it's co-designed it has the workforce and skills plan to it it brings in innovation and learning from industry and community and voluntary sector affordable sustainable and with a right governance route and i'm going to talk about um the kent and portsmouth but we're actually doing the playbook program now in six areas uh, and people can contact us if they want information on any of the other areas but we're here today to, to talk about Kent. Uh, and this programme was focused on prevention, particularly for marginalised groups. And to think about prevention is, is really important as to what we actually mean, because not actually everyone always agrees about this. We have some big centralised national approaches in key areas. These have been really important. They've been very successful in many ways but they are focused on individuals and conditions, on individual behavior change and specific conditions. But what we have to get to, and this is really important when we start to think about the economic base behind prevention is the contacts. We had the recent update from Sir Michael Marmot, uh, his tenure review on inequalities, 
and what he spoke about is proportionate universalism. If we have a centralized approach that treats the whole population in the same way and tries to apply a single intervention, we won't actually change the social gradient and inequalities. So we need an approach to prevention that's really getting to the underlying causes, the social determinants of health or the causes of the causes. And we've got to bring communities with us in this and empower people to be part of that change. So the overall approach is actually one that's about the whole economy, not just a discrete set of interventions for prevention. And thinking about marginalization with that context is really important because this can take many forms, they're not always apparent. And within the Kemp programme, we differentiated between sort of formal and informal approaches to thinking about marginalisation, because this is very much something that takes place in time and place. And it's key to understand the very localised, nuanced ways in which people live and the conditions in which they live that's leading to and creating marginalisation. And especially how we bring that into the context of people's lived experience. So if we think about the categories and areas that are producing marginalization, and these are all key to prevention, thinking about social isolation, mental illness, physical disability, uh, poverty, ethnicity, then actually how people experience their conditions of living are the main factors that's going to drive change and, and actually make prevention work. So we have to put that at the heart of the programme and thinking. And the economic argument for, for this and taking a, 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 an approach that looks at the social conditions and inequalities is absolutely key. In Kent alone, 111 million of additional costs have been associated with the variations in deprivation. 15% of all social care costs for people aged over 55. But the largest burdens actually falling in social care, community care and mental health, where the gradients are much, much higher. So if we don't take interventions that have the social determinants at their heart, then what we actually do is we end up with more affluent populations benefiting from prevention. And those who are more marginalised are actually at risk of becoming even more excluded. So in the Kent Action Plan, we, we spoke to a number of, of workers from across the public sector and community monetary sector and parish councils and service users. Um, and we looked at a lot of the evidence base. And these are the key things that we have identified in the Action Plan for change and development. Transport came up as a really significant issue, not just in terms of actually getting people to services, um, but actually thinking about alternative ways that transport options can really help people address health inequalities. And linked to that access point is actually what's happening with services. So it's not just a case of being able to get people to services with affordable transport. We've actually got to think how we've uplifted the access criteria. And this has been happening now for 10 years and is, is a very much an impact of austerity. So the the people now who are accessing services are those with the most severe problems. It's almost like we're waiting for problems to reach crisis point before we're actually really intervening. So we're going in the opposite direction in terms of prevention. And the, a lot of the burden of that has really fallen on the community and voluntary sector. So if we think just within our silos of health or social care, we'll ignore one of the fundamental facts at the moment that, that's really uh, important for this is how the a place-based mixture of services, including the community and voluntary sector, is really key. And we've learned from COVID that uh, particularly there's really differential impacts going on for some groups who are much more affected by what's been happening with COVID. Um, but also some of these differential impacts predate COVID, that we already had this built-in level of inequality for some marginalised groups and communities where they have um, a completely different experience. So we've got to get people's trust. If we're going to get people to engage before they reach crisis points and to actually think and change behaviour around prevention, they've got to trust. And we have to address the basis of exclusion on place. The, where people live, if they're cut off, if the services um, have disappeared and a lot of community ones have, then we've got to rethink the way that we think about this in terms of the local context of where people live and then be able to address the stigma that's associated, particularly with being marginalised, discriminated against, and how people withdraw and the less able and willing to engage. We've got to, within that context, then look specifically at the groups that are most affected and the factors of marginalisation that's driving that, and underpinning all of that is poverty. 
So in summary, we've got to take a very localized approach to prevention. We've got to think about it in terms of place. We've got to get consensus on what we mean about the definitions and moving away from an individual condition focused one to one that's actually bringing in social conditions. We've got to not just think about this in the sort of formal legal terms of identifying uh, groups that might be more marginalized, but to actually look at the lived experience of people's perspectives and, and what they are saying is important to do and to change. And that brings in a real need for co-production, community engagement has been key to embedding our approach. And it can't just be a one-off project. We've actually got to do this as a whole. And if I just speak about Portsmouth, um, in Portsmouth, we were looking specifically at social isolation and uh, loneliness. And this is a, a really underpinning area for a lot of factors that's feeding um, health harms and problems. There's, there's a strong evidence base here that just this area alone is responsible for, uh, is as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It creates increased risks for depression, cognitive decline in Alzheimer's, it's associated with coronary heart disease and stroke, and people are more likely to die prematurely. So the costs of just being socially isolated and lonely are really, really high. But actually, we talk about social isolation and loneliness, these people are knocking on every door. 80% more likely to visit a GP, 60% more likely to visit A&E, 30% more likely to have an emergency admission, and 350% more likely to enter local authority residential care. So the economic base for a prevention approach to this issue, and this is one of the most sort of marginalized groups or an aspect of marginalization that people really have in common, it's key. We do have um, some specific service elements that we try and use to approach this, and these are important, befriending schemes, day centre activities, bereavement counselling, but of far more importance are the um, structural interventions, the ones that are actually supporting communities themselves to build resilience, for people to connect, and thinking about volunteering, face groups, sports, and again, COVID has taught us a lot about the real value of community activism and engagement in this context and how powerful that can be to help address things. The Portsmouth Action Plan splits things up into three areas of getting the whole workforce to be more aware about the issues and thinking about that, being better able to recognise how the factors of social isolation and debt prevention affect people's health, and being able to respond to that and particularly thinking about the degree to which we build this into a risk assessment approach. COVID has made this even more important. We've got new at-risk population groups, so young people at the moment are actually reporting being even more isolated and lonely than some of the older groups. We've got to catch the learning from all that grassroots activity that's gone on so we can embed this for the future. And we don't actually, people talk about the new normal. I think there's a risk of returning to the old normal and that we'll lose some of the, the benefits of this community engagement that's been going on in terms of COVID. The economic case around this is equally high again. So additional social care costs just for the most lonely people are in excess of 6,000 per person a year. And we tend to approach um, prevention initiatives and, and, and looking for gains from the point of quality of life measures. But none of these are actually specific to pick up changes in loneliness level. They don't capture the benefits of reductions in loneliness for health. They don't capture the benefits working with particularly marginalised community or groups. And they can be quite narrow in some of those prevention focuses if they're just on individuals. The potential return on investment for breading schemes has been evaluated at £24 for every pound invested. So that's high. But imagine the savings if we were actually to take a much broader approach and think of a whole inclusive social economy to embed cost benefit analysis in overall needs assessments, thinking particularly about getting that financial approach into JSNAs. To bring a broader focus of benefits in terms of wider social gains, not just in terms of individual service gains, but actually how we get that economic renewal going fundamentally as part of our thinking about prevention. And then to get regular reports on that across the public sector. We want to actually extend the conversations around our playbook areas and would be really interested to hear from people on the call today if you want to know more about this, if you want to uh, share with us some of your own uh, initiatives and where you're moving beyond those traditional prevention initiatives to ones that get more fundamentally to the underlying conditions. 
I'm particularly thinking about how the role of place is central to our approach to commissioning, planning, service delivery and what that means in practice and we're very keen to engage with the directors of finance in developing new approaches to investment and prevention and you can contact us to do that we'll also send out the slides we'll share these with people because i've gone through this quite quickly but i'm very keen to actually bring in um, Anne and gordon to comment on the programs in kent and portsmouth uh, and their perspectives from their particular roles so uh, I think we can stop sharing there and I'd like to ask Anne to, to, to give us, to share some of her perspectives about this. Okay, thank you very much, John. And uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to, to say a few words. It's, um, I'm really delighted uh, that I'm able to, because it's been uh, uh, really good to work with the Breaking Barriers team. And uh, in uh, the presentation, uh, uh, about Kent, but actually also Portsmouth. Um, one of the key themes uh, that you've highlighted is that place-based approach. Uh, from my perspective, I used to be a director in adult social care and now work for the NHS as the SRO for workforce. And it, that has a really great connection. Um, uh, what's been proven is that sort of self-management and prevention is absolutely crucial for people's independence. Uh, and well-being uh, and it also reduces demand on services and that was very well evidenced uh, in the uh, in the presentation if i look at kent a lot of work has happened across the county in relation to prevention uh, very much looking at the sort of key uh, public health uh, sort of areas of prevention but not all the marginalized and vulnerable groups were reached and in the current climate, sort of, it's really even more crucial. And if you think about all the work um, that's happened uh, within the COVID emergency, uh, the place-based approach has proven to be the most successful approach, not looking across Kent as a whole, because Kent, probably like many other counties, is very big and uh, has very diverse communities. Having that very local approach, place-based approach, has really worked. Now, it has worked to a certain extent in the, in the COVID emergency, uh, but if you look at outcomes uh, in relation to the sort of more traditional uh, prevention, um, uh, there are lots of marginalized uh, groups that haven't really been able to access it. From uh, a, a sort of Kent perspective, what the Breaking Barriers team has done has been really helpful, sort of researching it at a strategic policy, but then sort of coming out with, with um, solutions at that local level and having the playbook for us to take that forward. If I look at Kent, um, we have a lot of resources commissioned and not only by health and social care. There are lots of other resources as part of our organization. So, for instance, um, if I look at our uh, economic team and our transport team, lots of resources are there, but we're not necessarily all talking together and really thinking together what would work in the local communities and talking to the communities to say what would work for you. That is something that we haven't been very good at, to do that in a joint up way. So if I look at prevention, it's really important not to only look at prevention from a very clinical perspective, but really to think about the community assets. Um, and if we talk about prevention, then I come into the Portsmouth area. People's well-being is just as important as the real pure clinical prevention. So for us, uh, we have a really well commissioned uh, social prescribing um, uh, service across Kent, uh, jointly commissioned with health and social care. And from a social prescribing perspective, we all know that it's really important that it's not only purely about um, uh, services that are already well known, but that you, for instance, use country parks and the ability to walk and to be outside. It's not only good for physical health, but also for mental health. Now, the social prescribers could prescribe that, but very often 
they don't really know how to prescribe it and how to also help people to access it. So my hope is that with uh, the work uh, on a, at a place-based level, that we can actually work with the community and to really think through how we could help them to, for instance, access walks and what we need to do in order to make that happen and what sort of barriers we need to overcome. We can only do that at that very local level because it might be different for everybody else. The other thing I really wanted to highlight is uh, that in order to make this work sustainable, uh, it has to be localised and it has to be uh, made local and we have to have input from the local communities in order to ensure that we don't have a sort of cross um, uh, Kent bland approach, but that we really look at what's necessary in the community. And one last thing to say is that for me, skills and widening participation uh, in this work is really important. So uh, I'm, we're hoping in Kent that we can really work with volunteers and that we help people to develop their skills whilst they're volunteering and working with us and then building up the skills so that in very poor areas where there's usually a lack of skills to help people to step out of their poverty, that we can help to help them to develop those skills. And to me, that's also a way of using the place-based approach and also making it sustainable. Thank you. Unmuted. Thank you. I believe we also now have some reflections from Gordon Fowler from Portsmouth. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me um, to speak today. Um, yeah, uh, everything that everybody's just been talking about um, is it, absolutely critical. I think the stats that John's just gone through um, very insightful, very informative, and it shows you what impact we could make. Um, to me, um, the co-production and the local place is absolutely key to it. Um, Everywhere is different, everyone's got different needs, and um, when I talk about co-production, I, I really mean that engagement. We've just had our engagement strategy, which is helped influenced by the work that John and his team have done, um, looking at the loneliness, for example, about, well, how do we get to those communities and how do we really hear? Because we may think they need something, but actually they don't. They've already got that. They've got that covered. So um, what is it that we need to be doing and are we funding things that maybe don't need to be. Um, so it really, really helps. And I think John was showing some stats there on the loneliness work that was done in the Portsmouth group, for example, the amount of um, a &E attendances and GP appointments just because um, of that loneliness, which actually was a rather um, clinical um, conditions apart from that. There wasn't that many, a lot of it was driven from that. So this um, uh, prevention um, can really have an impact on health, social, and voluntary organisations that um, support. Um, to me, uh, one of the, the hardest things is benefits. A lot of people speak to me, well, where's the benefits of this? And because um, everything is so big, um, people say, well, um, we'll never see the benefits. Are you sure it was this that was um, that impacted on it? Um, like we say, we've got some really good information and evidence there, um, Barnes, um, John and the, the work that his um, organisation did. Um, looking at this, which we then can follow up and see well what interventions there are that have been put in place, working with the people, um, and then seeing stats and and hopefully then um, being able to understand where they fall. Uh, I think it was mentioned by um, Ellie in the introduction about the um, across many organisations. That's a quite a normal reaction. Well, where does the benefit fall? How does it fall there? I don't think I see it. Other factors. So any um, support we have um, that helps give a clearer picture really, really helps this um, discussion and it can then help with great um, trying to influence because to me it's all about influence to be able to get that upfront investment to, to support with these um, plans. Um, that was all I was going to say, but thank you very much for asking me to. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gordon. And thank you to Dr. Bashford and Anne. Uh, last but not least, we are joined by Christina Marriott, Chief Executive at the Royal Society for Public Health. Christina has held a variety of roles across the health and charity sectors, 
including National Lead for Health Inequalities for NHS England and Chief Executive of the Revolving Doors Agency. She currently sits on the Department for Health and Social Care's Improving Population Health Advisory Group and the UK uh, Public Health System Group. Please do keep sending in your questions, and we will start, which we will start working through following Christina's presentation. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Christina. Thank you, and, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this webinar. You did. Um, it's been great hearing the local um, approach, the co-production approach, the playbook approach working, um, because my feeling is this is probably despite our systems rather than because of our systems. So I wanted to acknowledge the obvious issues around how we think about place and prevention. I thought it was a really interesting point that the SIP for PHE paper that was referred to earlier made that spend in healthcare is justified by recognising health as an asset, but that this doesn't translate over when we start thinking about prevention. We always have to justify prevention um, as causing a return on investment, and that investment will return savings. And more than that, our system specifies that those savings have to be available in a short time period. They have to be cashable savings, not just demand reduction. And crucially for today's conversations, those savings hopefully have to sit in the same budget, which means not just in the same public service, but at the same level. So at local or national level, it has to accrue back to the same budget. And I, I guess I start from a position of thinking if only people and their lives were quite that simple. Because the ridiculous thing is, we all know that prevention works. It saves money, but it also saves lives. But our systems make it nearly impossible to do. So in my previous role, which was referred to as at Revolving Doors, I've just spent five years working for system change for those who are repeatedly in the criminal justice system where their lives of severe disadvantage incurs truly staggering amounts of public spend, um, usually in crisis response, usually without changing the fundamentals of their lives, usually without removing them or their families from their misery. The models that we worked on, and, and we did some work around the new economy um, model um, using the Green Book, the models showed really substantial returns on investments for relatively small investments in, for example, substance misuse treatment or mental health services. And you can evidence really rapid savings in the weekly, sometimes daily A&E attendances. Um, you can show fewer children going into care and therefore savings to the local authority. And the time frame actually for overall savings is, is quite short. It's five years, increased investment in the first two to three years, but savings within the first five. But of course, the biggest savings are in the national budget lines. They are in benefits and in particular in the criminal justice spend. And so I watch loads of local commissioners and PCCs trying to get government to think about how they could recoup some of those savings back to the local level where they needed to spend the money. And it was frankly really frustrating watching the piecemeal and small scale steps forward for the amount of effort that was going in. It was a real example of how our local and national multiple service systems fail to either provide the best service or to maximise the bang for the public purse. But and this is similar to what I want to push us to think about today, which is to think about multiple prevention for multiple morbidity over the life course. Of course, these messy lives that we all live, there is going to be confusion and there's going to be confounders and there will be distant factors and there will be measurement issues. But the logic is undeniable. And my call to action is that we build systems that can respond to what we know is right. As we move towards place-based thinking, we need to be ambitious and brave about all it can achieve for the public's health. I'm going to approach this by thinking about our current challenge of COVID-19. Um, and I've chosen this because it's perhaps the epitome of a health protection issue. It is a novel virus pandemic and is about as far from prevention as you can get in public health. But I hope to convince you that even here, prevention, or rather the lack of investment in prevention in this country, has been key. Um, I'm going to be whizzing through some graphs, probably at some pace, um, so I'm happy for the presentation to be circulated after the webinar, 
to be clear, it's not the detail of these graphs that matter, it's the underlying picture where we can see the patterns. So England has, yeah, sorry, I just don't seem to be able to move. Um, England has internationally high mortality rates from COVID. As of Monday, we were the third highest in Europe behind Belgium and, and Spain, and we remain in the top 10 in the world in terms of our mortality rates. The international comparisons are not necessarily easy or, or necessarily precisely accurate at this stage, but it is clear that we are doing badly. And this is not easily explained in terms of our preparedness. Indeed, both us and the USA were both in good positions going into the pandemic in terms of our pandemic preparedness. Where we can begin to see some explanations is when we look at who has been affected. So you will be aware that COVID has exposed the underlying health inequalities in our very unequal society. Life expectancy was already beginning to drop in our poor society. John referred to Sir Michael Marmot's most re recent report, and that was showing that the stalling of the growth of life expectancy in the UK since 2010 has been harder and faster than in most comparable nations. And in this context, COVID has hit the communities already affected by health inequalities the hardest. So here we see the mortality rates for the most deprived to double that for the least deprived. In this case in Wales, but this is true throughout the UK. And the mortality for some ethnic groups, especially the Bangladeshi and black groups, is exceptionally high. And of course, as we know that some of the explanation for our comparative international performance is the degree of urban living in the UK, we also know that when we think about deprivation and ethnicity, some of the explanation is to do with exposure to infection through being a key worker. And here we've got the differential rates for different ethnic groups of being a key worker, especially in health and social care or living in crowded housing or living in an urban area or using public transport or not being able to work at home. Those are some of the explanations. But it is also about the impact of underlying highly preventable health conditions. And I will focus briefly on two linked conditions, overweight and obesity and on type 2 diabetes. Because the evidence is really clear that both were substantial risk factors for severe COVID. Here we see that a BMI of over 35 makes you four times more likely to have an ICU admission. And it is also highly significant for COVID related mortality. So type 2 diabetes more than doubles the risk of mortality in the over 80s and has even stronger effects at the other ages. So the health of our nation going into COVID was significant to our performance under COVID so far. And that health was not good. And it was not good in some rather predictable, unequal ways and with some of the most modifiable conditions. So we have the third highest rate in Europe for adult obesity, and these rates are highest in our poorest communities. Nearly twice as many adults are obese in our most deprived communities than in our least. And for women in this group, 60% have what is termed a very high waist circumference. And there are strong environmental reasons for this, including our planning, our food environment, our travel environment. Um, and this has been part of RSPH's previous work in this area. We also see those differences in obesity according to ethnicity. So 74% of the black communities, of people living in black communities in the UK, are overweight or obese compared to 62% of the general population. And we also see those differences in rates in type 2 diabetes, six times more common in the South Asian communities and three times more common in the black communities. So preventing mortality through a novel virus pandemic perhaps the definition of a health protection challenge is beginning to look also like a prevention challenge. Had we prevented the obesity and the type 2 diabetes, what might our mortality rates have looked like? And what might they have looked like, especially in our deprived and our ethnic minority communities? And this is why I'm going to ask us to look forward and think about where COVID and the coming recession will leave us. Because it seems predictable that the communities hit hardest by COVID will also be those hit hardest by the ensuing recession. They have the least secure employment and the evidence is already mounting. And we know that these communities are already most likely to suffer from comorbidities. 
the coexistence of one or more conditions. We know comorbidity is a growing challenge to our lives and to our health care. It is happening at a younger age. Those now in their 80s, brought up during the war of rationing, developed comorbidity in their 70s. It's now happening in our 60s. And it will not surprise you to know that this too is socially graded. Those in the poorest communities have higher levels of comorbidity and at younger ages. And this makes sense because of the common etiology of so many non-communicable diseases. The risk factors, the lack of physical activity, the poor nutrition, the smoking, and the wider determinants that underpin them, the poor housing, the lack of safe green spaces, the obesogenic environments, the relative socioeconomic position, the experience of racism, are all risk factors and determinants for whole clusters of disease. So having argued that comorbidity is a major factor in how we are being affected by COVID, I'm going to pull a couple of threads together. As a nation, we have been one of the worst affected by COVID mortality, and the evidence is that our economy has also been hit worse than comparable countries. We know that part of this is because of our health, or rather the comorbidities of the population as we went into the pandemic. It was our failure to tackle our prevention challenges. We know that some communities are being hit harder by the clustering of pre-existing comorbidities, pre-existing socioeconomic challenges, and now a heavier burden under COVID, and we can expect a heavier burden under the economic effects of COVID. And they are also the communities that are already most likely to suffer from comorbidities. And if long COVID proves to be a substantial issue, and I think there are indications it may be, they may be most affected by that also. And so I want to return to the shared etiology of disease and its determinants to throw you a last challenge, but also an enormous opportunity. Because we know for each of these make risk factors, the whole population structural change, as John was, was talking about, have the most potential as prevention measures. And they have the potential to work across whole clusters of comorbidities. So as we struggle to think about how we can work in a place-based way to prevent one disease, we should be acknowledging that the real potential is to take a structural approach to a whole pantheon of diseases. And in doing so, we need to acknowledge we can only truly approach prevention with a life course approach. We could not have prevented COVID mortality just from March onwards without having already tackled the living and working conditions of people and the health status of our ethnic minority and deprived communities. We know the routes from childhood obesity into the adult type two diabetes, much like we know the routes from poverty and adverse childhood experiences into adult lives of criminal justice contact. Our challenge is to change them. This is a technical challenge, how we conceive of whole life prevention and build public investment systems to support it. But there's also the real opportunity of putting the place into prevention and prevention into place. Thank you. Unmuted, muted, unmuted, muted, unmuted. Wonderful. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to all of our speakers. So we're going to move into the Q&A portion now. So let me just pop out our question box. Great. So I think we're going to kick off with bringing it back to some of the content that was in Dr. Bashford's presentation and the sort of hyper local nature of place. So, Ellie, I was hoping to bring you in on this first. How do we define place? How hyper local should that be? And what, what is the division between local and national with this particular issue? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, how do we define place? I don't, I don't think there is a single definition. I think that very much depends on what you are trying to achieve and what you are looking at. So, as an example, um, our chair mentioned at the beginning that one of the areas I work on is health and social care integration. Um, those of you that are aware of that, apologies telling you stuff you already know. But the way that that's being done in England is, is to form integrated care systems or, or sustainability and transformation partnerships that are composed of um, NHS and local government organisations across a 
some of them fairly large geographies, some of them are, are, are smaller. Um, but within those systems, there's then three different levels of place, if you like. And I think that's a recognition that some things you can do on a, a large version of place, but there are other things where you actually have to get drilled down into the community level because even within that limited geography, the problems are not all going to be the same across the different communities. So whilst you may able, might be able to do to build back up to the larger geography for things like commissioning, um, you're not going to be able to address specific problems and involve voluntary and community groups in co-production, etc., at such a level. So I think that there is no single definition of place. Um, in terms of funding, because I'm very aware that I said at the start, you know, suggested that perhaps we should be funded on the basis of place, and then to say that there's no single definition makes that quite difficult. Um, but I think that you can't fund individual communities for public services. I think we have to recognise that. That, that would be an administrative and bureaucratic nightmare. But I think that moving towards a more regional or even sub-regional level of funding helps the dissemination down to those smaller levels. I'm not sure if that's helpful or answers the question, but please follow up if it doesn't. And Gordon, you're, you're, both, you're both coming to us today from that kind of local perspective. So do you have any reflections on Ellie's thoughts on the definition of place? Um, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I think place can be very varied and that doesn't help if you bring it back to levels of funding and how would you do that. But working in a place doesn't necessarily mean that the funding has to uh, be, be sort of... Uh, uh, brought down to that place necessarily it can be more a wider funding but then really working in the place and we've had lots and lots of examples of um, what a place could be it could be a very small place it could be around a vulnerable group uh, living in a place and, and really thinking through how we can help them to access services or, or what is the barrier against it um, what we are doing with our Breaking Barriers project is that we're looking at um, two places, one very much sort of determined by um, uh, sort of the BAME uh, group and, and to see how we can uh, encourage wider access to services and how we can develop that together. Uh, but the other one is just uh, the Isle of Sheppey, which is a, a quite small place. I mean, geographically, it's not that small, but uh, if you look at inhabitants, but it has its own uh, very particular problems. And we do really want to test that if we work there, what does that then mean for levelling up and, and what does that mean then for how you determine where the funding should go? Um, yes, and thanks for inviting me in. Um, agreeing with what Ellie was saying as well um, there, you know, you do have those higher regions, so you may have a looking at a CS level where actually that is a solution that you would be looking for. You may want to go down to an ICP um, level. Um, it may be um, difference in your um, ICS, you have um, different components, you break it out into ICPs, and it may be that an ICP delivers that solution. That may not work either, so then you go right down to the place-based um, integration and looking at it um, specifically there. So there's different levels and different um, aspects for different um, parts of the problem. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have another question for Christina. So Christina, in your presentation, you highlighted the fact that health inequalities is an area where a greater focus on prevention would have improved our overall preparedness for the pandemic. Do you think there are any other, any other areas where a more preventative approach could have impacted and lessons can be learned from the experience of COVID? Um, I, I think generally the Health One Nation going into COVID is, is a huge arguer for, for prevention because much as I highlighted the obesity and type 2 diabetes rates in deprived and ethnic minority communities, we know that as a nation, actually, we have enormous levels of obesity and overweight compared with most of our European neighbours. Um, so, so 
much as the highlight is around around those communities that are challenged by health inequalities, actually as a nation, we're also not very very um, healthy going into this. Um, I would also highlight we've made some great strides around smoking, and I think there is a, a huge argument there for the kind of structural and, and actually maybe slightly against a local place-based approach. I think the national prevention work that came in with the smoking ban, the, the ban on smoking in public places after 2007, made a huge difference to our smoking rates and actually put us in quite a good place. So not everything is around local, although I would echo what people have said before, and we indeed do some really local work with, with a set of programmes called Communities in Charge, which are really about small communities defining their challenges and, and finding the solutions to those challenges um, through things like peer mentoring and health champions and actually through a bit of political activism to try and change their place as well so we work very much at the local level but i also think we need to acknowledge that the structural prevention is very important so it was great that it, as a nation we moved towards the structural um, movement on smoking I would like to see us move into a similar place around food and um, reformulation and to try and approach obesity in that way because I think we are tinkering at the edges of it. But we had some very open prevention goals as a country as we went into COVID. Uh, Dr. Bashford, it would be brilliant to bring you in on that particular question as well. Do you have any reflections on what areas of prevention would have been particularly key for supporting our efforts against COVID? To me, the, the biggest learning from COVID has been, and, and this I think links to the first question as well, in, in terms of how we understand place and local communities. So what we've seen is neighbours going round to people that they hadn't known before, knocking on the door, asking if they're OK. We've had WhatsApp dance groups in streets, with people collecting prescriptions for people. There's a level of volunteering and support and local neighbourhood concern that I, I, I think we haven't seen for a very, very long time. And that is truly valuable. And all the things we've learned from the playbooks is that if you don't get to that very localised, nuanced understanding and like that, you know, people relate to the streets in which they live, the local shops they use, the pub, the Christine spoke about people using local parks. These are the things that make a community thrive. And in terms of prevention and impact on COVID, I think that's where the real gains have been made. But what we're not doing is formally capturing that, particularly in, its, in, in an investment way of thinking as to how we, you know, so we've all been really pleased, this volunteering is happening, it's like a free gift in a way, but it's not free. It's costing people their time. We've also got a lot of people who've been able to do that because of furloughing and other things. We've seen a, a drop in the age of volunteering. But as we're now getting people back into the workplace, moving into restore and recovery, we, we, we're gonna lose some of these people because they've got to go back to their normal uh, daily lives and all the demands and competing things. So I think at a system level, at a health and care system level, whether that's from an STP or a local ICS, We've got to start thinking, how do we translate the thinking about prevention and our whole budgetary approach into capturing and supporting that very localised neighbourhood level of activity? Because to me, that's the heart of prevention. That's where some of the most effective things happen. It's no good lecturing people from the centre about uh, behaviour change, about losing weight or exercising. We've got to start with where people are living and what's happening in their immediate local environment. Ellie, I think you said you were, you'd be interested in chipping in on this one. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with everything that both Christina and John have said. I just wanted to take it a little bit wider, really. I think one of the things that we've, where, one of the areas where we've clearly seen an impact of coronavirus is obviously in the social care sector, and um, what were really tragic consequences there. And, um, SAPFA worked together with the Institute for Government on a, an ongoing project called Performance Tracker that, that tracks various public services and how they perform. And this year we were thrown into disarray slightly by, by like, like everybody else, by coronavirus. So we decided to take a different approach this year. And over the summer we, we issued a publication that looked at how prepared various different aspects of the public sector were. Um, and it was a very much um, qualitative piece of work, if you like, in that we, we did it by conducting interviews um, from people with 
experience from different public services. But adult social care came out as a clear area where they were the sector was caught on the back foot by this. You know, as a whole, the sector has been in crisis and in inverted commas um, for quite some time, not only in terms of funding, but in terms of workforce and increasing demand. And actually, you could never have been expected to be able to deal with an event of this magnitude. And when we went back and looked over the last few years, what we found was that in all the pandemic preparedness work that had been done, albeit not on the basis of coronavirus, but in particularly from um, the, the sickness exercise, there had been quite a few recommendations and other underlying signals that this was a sector where there needed to be more work on preparedness and preventative measures. And, and that that hadn't that hadn't happened, and therefore it's not surprising that we were caught on the back foot. And I think that we have to appreciate that it's a sector that is struggling to meet its statutory duties and just doesn't have the bandwidth at the moment to be able to even contemplate in many areas taking a preventative approach. But I think that's a really clear lesson that we need to learn from this experience that they have to be given that bandwidth to be able to do this so that we don't see this situation again. Excellent. Thank you, Ellie. Um, we have another question. And what would the panel see as the role of finance professionals in the prevention agenda? Um, Ellie, if you want to come in on this one first, um, and then it would be a good thing. It would be great to get Anne and Gordon's reflections on that. You can see Gordon smiling. <laughs> Director of finance on the squad there. Um, to my mind, and this is very much how we, we pitched our publication on evaluating preventative investment, we pitched that as a challenge, as a call to action for the finance profession. From all the directors of the finance and CFOs that I've spoken to over the last two years in looking at this, they all, they all get prevention. As Christina said, they all know it's the right thing to do. And I think more broadly, we see the finance profession as the enablers. You know, they've got their fingers on the purse strings. They don't want to pull them closed. They want to be able to open them up and enable their services to do the right thing. So the profession as a whole gets it. Unfortunately, they get a lot of other things as well and want to enable those. And there's only a limited amount of pennies in the pot, so to speak. Um, so when we issued that framework, it was very much as a challenge to the professionals. Okay, we've tried to address some of the problems that you tell us you run into, you know, the short termism. You know, if we're if we're being cynical about it, prevention, um the, the programmes and approaches involved often last for longer than your average political cycle. So perhaps, you know, the decision makers um, quite on the same page there in terms of the time scale. So it's and and we also hear that there's not sufficient evidence, which you know I think those of us that spend any time looking at prevention, there's a wealth of evidence, but much of it is spoken about in a clinical or in a health context. You know, if you look at a traditional public health and prevention then the evaluation is done on the basis of quality of life and, and it, as Christina pointed out, seeing health as an asset. That's not a universal language when you start going across different organisations. Your average local councillor, no disrespect to them, doesn't know what a quality is or what it means to them or how it benefits them. You have to be able to translate that back to the impact on the place. You know, the improvement in an individual's health is going to allow them to be a greater economic contributor. And I think that the finance profession have an understanding of the different modes of evaluation. And, you know, yeah, we have to attach a pound sign to, to some of these things, and that's perhaps distasteful, but it is a common language that's understood by all the players. And I think that the finance profession are key in that because that's what they're used to doing is, is communicating these issues to the people that 
that make the decisions. So I think they're key in developing this common language and helping to bolster this evidence base so that we can enable these approaches to be taken forward. And I'm hoping Gordon won't disagree with me on that. I, I, um, I struggle to add, you make such a comprehensive answer. That's really, um, do you want my job? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> I'm not no, okay. I, no, it, you're absolutely spot on about um, the issues and the complications that, that it cause. And um, I, I think the only bits I'd add is um, the complexities as well. And this is where um, getting place-based solutions may help and how we look at funding as well when it's place-based. Because at the moment, you've got lots of different organisations where you may need to spend money here, but it impacts over there on this different organisation. And people have that mentality. Um, where we need to be getting, no, this is a place-based solution, so let's think about it on there and think about how it impacts us as a whole. Um, so I, that, that back to it. And um, I, I on it, it's that language and that information. There is a wealth of wealth of clinical information um, and knowledge and that we know will happen. And just examples that have been presented today, we know that that has an impact. We know that that means people turn up at AD and all that. So, so we know that those things are happening. Um, and um, I, I think I said it earlier enough, I don't apologize, but it, it is our job to influence. It really is our job to influence. And it is by having that common understanding um, and breaking down the barriers of looking at things in silo somebody's got to spend here but it benefits there it's got to be that that cross work together and i believe the place-based care will help us with that i'm already seeing that in decisions and discussions that we're doing now when we're looking at the last six months of this year we're looking at it and we're realizing we've got a problem as an ics where we are at as an icp let's bring it down into there and trying to understand it better and see where where we need to do things and what the priorities are for those areas so, but um, thank you. Anne, do you have anything to add there? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I completely agree with uh, Eleanor and Gordon, and uh, really good that Gordon's here from a finance perspective. And and you mentioned very briefly, Eleanor, the the sort of short term nature of funding very often for preventative projects, and um, and I we've had lots of short term funding for it and even evaluation, and it's then the willingness to take in the outcomes of an evaluation and the outcomes of the short term project, and very often. Uh, it's not possible then to get that scaled up or understood. Um, and the point that you made, Gordon, about um, uh, organisations in one system still having separate uh, budgets. So the decision to trust that if you invest here, you get an outcome there, and then to actually make that happen, uh, that is still a, a big challenge. Thank you. I think that so a lot of what you were saying there actually links quite nicely into the next question we've got in. And this is probably one that it would be great to hear from Christina and John. So you were talking there about breaking down silos and developing common language and common understanding. So how can we best increase the links between health, uh, our health sector colleagues and those in local authorities, whether that's directors of transport or environment or social care or any other services to increase attention to the issue of the social determinants of health? Christina, would you like to come in on that one first? Okay, um, to, just to actually pick up on the on the previous one, I actually think finance is so key to making this work across place. And 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 what people can do is is commit to that collaboration across the place base and to facilitating, demonstrating how we can get public sector savings through, uh, you know, to, despite the issues of short short termism. That piece of collaboration at the local is absolutely where this will be driven from. It's where it's where the impact on communities will be, but it will also be how we develop the evidence base that can take this forward. And I think actually a coalition of willing finance people in local in local systems it will be transformative. I think their challenge after that will be finding the equally collaborative and willing people at national level who can then get into a conversation about how you work with budgets where the savings accrue to national. And I think that's a, a real issue 
actually because I think we can do fantastic work mm -hmm. local. Um, but the local should get about the benefits of that, and that includes the benefits to the benefit purse, and it includes the benefits to the criminal justice purse, and, and we need to find mechanisms of doing that. Those of us who aren't finance experts can't be the people who find the solutions to that, so absolutely for finance to take forward to, to and to work collaboratively to have those robust conversations um, back to Treasury and to Whitehall. Um, Sorry, having commented on the previous comment, this was around how we can get local authority and health to speak this common language. Yes, and John, to... do you want to start and I'll pick up. Yeah, um, I mean, this is absolutely something that the, the BBI playbook seeks to do. Um, and from the very outset, and that first building block of strategic alignment is about bringing these disparate groups together. And I think it's not just health and local authority, we've got to get the community and voluntary sector in at the outset. Mm -hmm. And we've got to recognize that the building blocks are interdependent. So it's not just system leaders, and it, it would be really good to have finance directors in some of those meetings at a much, much earlier point. We bring them in far too late. But also, uh, one of the aspects of the, the BBI playbook is cross professional learning. So we talk, we've been talking a lot about the kind of in organizational silos and overcoming those to get a placebook approach. We've also got to address the professional silos. So some of the things we're looking at in Kemp, for instance, is how to use role rotation and to get different public sector workers to interchange with each other. Let's get some paramedics in primary care. Let's get some social workers uh, in, in um, different aspects of health provision and some nurses into social care positions. Let's look at the whole issue of placements within learning contexts and make greater use of some of the community and voluntary sector agencies um, and if we take a, a competency-based approach to professional learning it moves us into a different position and I think these are powerful tools to break down professional silos and then to get them we can then start to develop that common language and we can get much more common understanding of how each individual intervention is great but actually it's how we get the the whole of the sum of those parts and actually get a more collective understanding of each other's roles uh, and, and areas of responsibility but how we can fundamentally um, act as a whole across a different types of workforce rather than individually and i think it'd be really good to bring finance into that notion of role rotation it's 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 not easy to I've got to really capacity uh, but it's it, it's possible and we are starting to see some of this I think from, from my experience also one of the real breakthrough moments across any kind of cross cross uh, sector piece of work is actually starting from the human and that's about understanding the lives and working in co-production or listening to communities or actually just you know using design techniques that take uh, tip you know typical people who are using services just putting the focus on the the individual human being at the center of these services and then thinking about your design from that place outwards i think actually can be quite transformative because suddenly you realize that you know the top 10 um often referred to as things like frequent flyers high volume service users in one system will also be the top 10 in every other service and then thinking about what that life might look like to actually lead or even better talking to the person whose life it is that's being led and asking them where their design solutions um, would, you know, what, what do they want their services to look like? What would work for them? What should this look like? Actually can be massively transformative, but it all, also can be really inspiring for people working in public services to be able to focus back on, on the human beings that they're all there to serve. And, and I think that works really well. I think there are ways of facilitating that. Sometimes things like co-location and hubs work really well as well. So getting people physically out of their silos into offices, thinking about the same people and talking to those people and more more importantly, listening to their service users, I think can be really transformative in, in thinking about how we do public service. Okay, can I add to that? Is there time for that? Absolutely. Um, well, it, it's, I really uh, uh, like what you're saying, Christina, and I think that is absolutely core to uh, a way 
to uh, to almost force organizations and and systems to work together and in kent we're uh, implementing the esther program which is well, it's not a program it's the esther philosophy which we have taken from sweden and the key thing is that we all talk to individuals and say what matters to you and and what is really instead of what is the matter with you and we have our own solutions but what matters to you and by doing that all the health and social care professionals but also people in the community um, uh, we have parish councils who are joining into that and it's really interesting uh, and it's probably not uh, unknown but for instance uh, for a, a key health and social care problem uh, transport was the main issue it wasn't a health and social care solution it was really looking at the transport issue and it actually made organizations think how can we do this differently together so our ESTA program is now part of multidisciplinary team meetings etc and we're rolling that out so that that really uh, uh, is is a uh, key to making organizations work together so thank you for that brilliant thank you Anne I think we've probably got time for one more question and I think this would be one that uh, Anne and Gordon if we could get your reflections on it that would be great so a couple of the conversations we've been having so far have been rooted in Covid but obviously from the presentations we've seen from all of you the case for prevention has far preceded uh, the emergence of coronavirus. So we've touched on the impact of prevention on loneliness and on public health and the role of transport. But beyond the BBI projects that the two of you have been involved with, which services do you think there are the kind of biggest gains to be had as far as the preventative approach is concerned? Well, that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure that we can give a, or I could give a general answer to that, um, because it very much depends on um, if, if I'm looking at the work in Kent with PBI, is is the sort of thinking about marginalised groups. Well, uh, there will be very different solutions for very different groups of people and for individuals. Uh, as Christina said, let's talk to the individual. Um, we're actually looking at a multiple of things that could make a, a difference. Uh, I refer to, um, for instance, uh, in very poor communities, people can't get out of the sort of poverty gap and can't get into work and haven't got the skills for it. Uh, we have found that some of the, for instance, care providers don't want to open up a care provision in certain areas because they know there are not the skills available there. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I wouldn't really want to tie us down to say, it's this, this or the other. I think it could be very diverse. And from the work that we have done so far, uh, and also the knock-on effect of making people aware of that, there are more and more um, uh, businesses, organizations coming forward saying, we want to contribute to that. We have a very successful dementia-friendly community program mm -hmm. uh, in Kent. And very key contributors are um, supermarkets, uh, banks, uh, other shops and other services which are clearly social uh, care and health uh, services and they are making a real big big difference for people with uh, dementia and making their services safe and accessible. So as far as I'm concerned it can be anything that contributes to it and that's why play space is so important uh, because we can start planning from an ICP and an ICS and a health and social care perspective but actually if you are in the community and you ask people what makes the biggest difference it might be a, a completely different um, a thing that will unlock people accessing uh, uh, services or even accessing uh, uh, activities that will help them to, um, to, to feel better to be better to, for their health to improve but I also always want to add their well-being Brilliant. Gordon, um, I, think, I think you've got about uh, a minute and a half to add some closing remarks think, on that I mean, one. Very quick. Um, agree. It's across many, many services. I think where um, I think the greater demand might go, where we then need to really probably focus on the prevention is the mental health side of um, services. I, I do think that is um, a, a key concern um, going forward. Um, but prevention and what you do can impact across all of our services, like Anne said. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Gordon. And thank you to all of our speakers today. I'm afraid that is where we have to wrap up. 
Um, this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel shortly, the SIPFA YouTube channel. So please do subscribe to watch it back or to share with colleagues. The slides and the uh, video will be circulated to delegates afterwards. Um, uh, our YouTube channel also has access to all of our previous and future free webinars. So we hope you found this interesting and informative and we will see you next time.